Miracles abound, and last time I promised to show you something that might surprise you, and I, I think God is going to surprise us all today. I think he did. I, I'm so pleased with the way you participated in communion. Just loved, loved your, your willingness to give and to receive the way that you did. But last week I, I said I'm going to share something with you that will surprise you, but I didn't want to share it because I wanted to make sure that I was correctly dividing the Word of God. God put it on my heart because he had more to teach me. But first we set the stage with Elizabeth and Mary, and I know it's not Christmas season. But number one, two miraculous pregnancies. Pam and I have seen some amazing pregnancies only God could, could enable. And probably the most astounding, though there's been others, but we, I, we were both together in Cleveland doing a seminar at the Cleveland uh, Church of God, and a lady came up to me with her daughter, probably in her early 20s, and she said, will you pray for my daughter? She's been pregnant several times, but never has been able to have a live birth. And a word of knowledge came to me, and I said to her, was your father or grandfather a Freemason? And I don't remember which one was, but one of them was, and I broke the curse of Freemasonry and asked the Lord to heal this woman's womb. And Pam, with a word of knowledge, said, she just smiled a little, you know, Pam, the way she is, so sweet. She said, don't be surprised if you have a little girl. A year later, I was asked back to the same church. I don't think Pam went with me that time. But this woman brought her little baby, a few weeks old, to the church and asked me if I would dedicate it to the Lord. And what a thrill it was that, that God did an amazing thing for that woman. And we dedicated to the Lord. And this lady brought her sister, who was older than her, who had also been pregnant many times, but never had given a live birth. And she came for prayer and, and uh, Pam wasn't there, so no, no prophecy was given, but uh, uh, she started having babies. And, and David went there with me one time and, and ministered. That was fun. Um, but I um, went back several years later, and this lady, I didn't remember. She had changed in the amount of time that I'd been there. And I see so many people, I, I, I just forget. I'm sorry, I forget. But this lady came up to me at the beginning of the seminar with a full photo album. And I said, why are you showing this to me? <laughs> I mean, I like people, but this isn't a good time. These are all the grandkids I've had since you prayed for my daughters. That was miraculous. It was a wow God moment. But there's something more. There's something more that happened with Elizabeth and Mary's pregnancies. They're far more astounding. The Bible says Elizabeth was well along or well advanced in years, Luke 1, 7. In that day, being without children was not only a social disgrace. Having children was your social security. Your kids took care of you when you were old. And both she and Zechariah had, had wanted to have children. They had prayed. They had tried to get pregnant. And they were probably in their 60s, 70s. One person says 80s. Imagine the shock when an angel announced, you're going to have a baby. Amazing. Well, Mary's story was even more amazing. She had never known a man. And two, if you're taking notes, Mary visits Elizabeth and they share their stories of their miraculous pregnancies. And we know from the scripture and from memory, when Elizabeth was around six months pregnant, Mary, three months pregnant, visited Elizabeth. Mary had heard, and it's astounding how she heard, she had heard that, that Elizabeth was pregnant and traveled to see her. How did she know? Well, an angel told her. And just based on an angel, words of an angel, Mary started to visit Elizabeth, who was li living in Ayan Karim at the time, about 100 miles away. A man could walk that pretty easily in, in 10 days, Mary was three months with child. It may have taken her a, long, a lot longer. But letter A in your note, notes, a baby leapt in Elizabeth's womb when she heard Mary's greeting. Now Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste. You tell me how fast a three months pregnant lady can hurry. 
But anyway, she went to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And half on when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leapt with, leaped within her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. This was before the day of Pentecost. This was before it was easily accessible. But she was filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit of God. And let her be, um, Elizabeth immediately prophesied. I doubt, in fact, I know she had never prophesied before. But she had been filled with the Holy Spirit. And she prophesied to Mary, your son is the Lord. Now, the only way Elizabeth could know or believe Jesus was and is the Lord was the Holy Spirit who had just filled her. Amazing truths are, are revealed to people after they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth, having been filled with the Holy Spirit, prophesied over Mary. Then she spoke out with a loud voice, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as I heard the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leapt to, leaped in my womb for joy. And that, that's a characteristic of filling of the Holy Spirit is joy, Jesus overflowing you. And, and that's exactly what happened with her. And Elizabeth went on, Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which had, were told her from the Lord. Now women usually, or at least often, receive revelation before men. Elizabeth prophesied when she heard Mary's voice. It was immediate. Her husband John prophesied, or Zacharias prophesied after John the Baptist's birth, at least nine months later. And the angel activities uh, with, with Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph ended a 400-year period of silence. From the time of Malachi to these events in the book of Matthew, God had just backed away and quit talking to people. You know, if you ignore him long enough, he'll quit talking. But in... The story gives great encouragement to people who have given up hope and believe that they were too old or too tired or too something to be greatly used of God. You are not too old to be used of God if you're still breathing. I listened to Bill Hammond last week. He turns 91 this year. 71 years in the ministry, 91 years of life. He doesn't travel much anymore. He was work ministering through Zoom at a gathering at his son Tom and Jane Hammond's ministry. But in Luke 136, an angel told Mary, her cousin, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, Elizabeth had conceived a son in her old age and was six months pregnant. The Greek word translated cousin really means kinswoman or relative. It doesn't give a precise degree of relationship. But with their age difference, Elizabeth may have been Mary's great or great, great auntie. One source suggests that, that Elizabeth was in her late 80s when John was born. Crosswalk suggests Mary, Mary was between 12 or 14 when Jesus was born. Got questions, um, or uh, yeah, got questions says she was between 15 and 16. Christianity did today on January 18th this year agrees that, that Mary was probably 15 or 16 and that, that Elizabeth was really old. And, and Mary was quite young. Elizabeth was quite old, past, far past childbearing age. And they probably knew of each other. But there's a very good chance that they'd never met each other. And we're not going to consider John the Baptist or Jesus' younger years here. It's unknown if Jesus and John ever had opportunities together to play together, had ever met each other, or even if Mary and Elizabeth ever had opportunity to meet Mary's firstborn son, Jesus. But obviously that John somehow understood the mission of baptizing people with water but I'm going to show you he did not yet know Jesus personally. John 1, 29 and through 31. 
The next day, Jesus saw Jesus coming toward, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold. That, that, that's an important, behold. I, I want you to get a hold of this. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is be pre preferred before me, for he was before me. Now notice, Jesus was three months younger than, than John. And John said, I did not know him. Pretty obvious. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. Now, let's unpack with it. God gave John the Baptist an idea that he did not see. It wasn't before him. It was an idea. And he moved forward with faith because he knew that this Jesus, whom he had not met, was coming. And he started baptizing people um, the baptism of repentance. And isn't that what Hebrews says? That faith is believing in what in that which you do not yet see. Number three, John had a, a, a eureka moment, revelation of Jesus as the Lamb of God. Despite the pictures of a sissy looking Jesus with a halo around his head, Jesus, though fully God, manifested as fully human. He didn't stand out in the crowd before he began his public ministry. John received uh, God's revelation, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Letter A in your notes, people need the revelation of Jesus so they can believe and be saved. And we won't unpack these scriptures, but you can look at them later. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 to 4 and 10 through to, uh, 3 to 6 tell you exactly how you pray for lost people, exactly how you pray for prodigals. And Paul tells us to war for, for people so that they might see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ personally. If you want your family, your friends, your acquaintances to be saved, you have to engage in spiritual warfare so that they'll be able to believe on Jesus. And I am going to take a little bit of a minute. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, he said that the gospel is, is veiled in people. It's not to, so they will not see. It says they cannot see. And the word veil, veil is calypsus. In the, the old, in the New Testament, in the Greek, the, the Greek uses the word um, apple, really the way we use un. We would say unproductive, it would say ah productive. Unfruitful, we, Greek would say ah fruitful. And, and Paul says that the, the, the gospel is veiled, calypsus is revelation the kind of revelation that only Jesus can give through the Spirit of Christ. And the apocalypse means that the gospel is, is veiled. And he tells us how to pray that the veil be brought down and torn. And it's specific so that they might see the light of the photismo. The, the, the word light is in the Greek is photismo that we get photograph from or photo from. He said, I want you to pray that the aperture of their soul might be open, that the, the imprint of the gospel might be imprinted on their soul so they can respond to Jesus. And then in, in 10, 3 and 6, and I won't go through that, but it talks about tearing down the logic systems, the schemes of Satan and so on to get people saved. So Paul tells us to, to, to do warfare that, for them. And let her be, John received revelation of Jesus when, not before, but when he saw him, Jesus, coming toward him. The next day, John 1, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, look, wow, let this imprint you. This is the Lamb of God, the Paschal Lamb, the Passover Lamb, who comes to take the way the the sin of the world. And the way it's written in the Greek, this, this word denotes a surprise and a command. Confess Jesus as the Lamb of God. After waiting for and expectantly for centuries for the Messiah to manifest, there came that divine moment when this hope was made manifest. And John finally knew that he knew. At that moment, God made the hope of glory manifest 
in John's heart. Now John had passed and participated in Passover year after year, taking part in the slaying and preparation of his family's Paschal lamb that pointed to this moment when John declared, Behold, he's here. Only the Lamb of God can take away the sin of individuals and the sin of the world. Behold, Jesus, the Lamb of God, is the only hope for 2024. Let us see, verse 30 shows John understood his call before knowing the details. Verse 30, then he said, After me comes a man who is before, preferred before me, for he was before me. We dare not wait until we know everything God wants us to do. We must step forward into what he wants us to do now. You might know in part, well, do that part. John had gone through the seminary of the wilderness, daring to wear camel skin and eating locusts and wild honey, not because he had arrived at his moment, but because he was pressing on to fulfill God's call. He pressed in even when he walked in obscurity and unnoticed or mocked. He kept on keeping on until the crowning moment of beholding Jesus, the Lamb of God. How did he do that? How did he not give up hope before his dream and calling was manifested? How did he dare keep on doing and giving his best until the crowning moment came? And how did he at that very moment declare Jesus is preferred before me, for he was before me? Well, he realized it was Jesus. When you realize it's Jesus, you realize it's not about you. It doesn't matter if you win the applause of man. It doesn't matter if others are preferred before you. You're just following orders from heaven. And letter D, John pressed on until, say until. If your dream haven't, hasn't manifested yet, you're in the until moment. Don't give up. You might be this close. Or you might be this close. Don't give up. Never give up. Verse 131. I did not know him, John says. But that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, because of the idea, the hope of an idea, I came baptizing in water. Now God's so funny. I tried to work on this message. I, I, I start working weeks ahead, and I started working on this message Wednesday morning, January 31st. And I was listening, half listening to the National Gathering of Prayer and Repentance 2024 done by FRC. And I was able to keep on keeping on until some young people, teens and college age, came to the microphone and began crying out to God for our younger generation. Their passion stirred in me a desire to see Jesus released in and upon this land, and it stirred me to tears. May God raise up this generation. I'll tell you, the reason the prodigals are so prodigal is because the devil knows what God wants to do for them and in them and through them. And they're being stretched to the point that they're going to have to take up their cross, deny themselves and follow him to break through to freedom. But notice how John pressed on with his limited knowledge and understanding, even when he did not yet know Jesus personally. He baptized people in repentance, not knowing the fullness of the gospel that would be in the future revealed if he would never, never, never give up. So many people sit around waiting for their glory to come home. Seemingly blind to the now needs all around them. We must be faithful in that which is least if we want to be given greater responsibility and opportunity. Jesus said he who is faithful in that which is least is also faithful in much. He who is unjust in, in what is least is also in much. But number four, John was able to testify only of what he had personally experienced. And John bore witness, verse 32, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, 
and he remained on him. I remember the summer. It was a, a rough summer here. And that summer there was two white doves with red feet. Now David said they were pigeon, and I, I don't know. To me they were doves. But they pranced around for a week or two. They were, I'd come out of the office and they'd be there walking around. And, and I just knew that, that spirit wanted some, to do something. And the red told me that, that we really needed to apply the blood of Jesus to get the job of the spirit done. But John said, I, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained on him. It wasn't a visit. It was a habitation. I did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him. I don't see any evidence that God had foretold John that it was going to come in the form of a dove. But whom you see the Spirit coming upon and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is our Savior. He is our healer. He is our baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He is our uh, soon coming dove. We must never forget that one of Jesus' greatest missions is to baptize us with the Holy Spirit. And John said, uh, and I've seen and testified, this is the Son of God, letter A. And, and as John followed the revelation, get, get, get this Bible principle. As he followed the revelation he was given, further revelation was released. That's a principle of the kingdom. You act on what you're given, and until you do, the more is withheld. So John was sent to baptize in repentance before he really knew who Jesus was. The one who sent him to baptize with water told him that the one with a capital O upon whom the Spirit descended and remained on was, was Jesus, and he is that. So number five, John hesitated to baptize Jesus. Even before he really knew Jesus was the Messiah, he was preparing people for the coming king by baptizing them in water under repentance. But John wasn't sure he was the one to baptize Jesus. Verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to, to prevent him. Lord, I need to be baptized by you and you're coming to me. I understand why he hesitated. I have prayed for and baptized people whom I honored far above myself, especially when I took my first church in 1976 at the ripe old age of 25. And even though John was a few months older than Jesus, it wasn't an ordinary man that he was, that came to be baptized. It was Jesus, the incarnate son of God. And number six, grab hold of this. Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. He said that. Uh, but Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is filling, fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, John the Baptist, allowed him. Remember, Jesus never sinned. But pap baptism is more than getting people wet. It is stepping into a greater righteousness of God than humanly possible, even for the incarnate Son of God. While a few churches teach baptismal regeneration and say that without being baptized, a person is not fully saved, there's far more churches that, that way underestimate the value of Christian baptism. When I first came to Sturgis as an evangelical, our church grew really fast. It was amazing, really amazing. And I kept track of the people that are being saved. And after two or three years, I looked over the records only about a third of those who were saved but not baptized remained faithful to Jesus in our church. At least twice that many at the time who were saved and baptized remained faithful both to God and to our church. Believers' baptism really does make a difference. And it was fitting for Jesus to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. If that's true, it must be fitting for all his believers as well. One of the greatest joys of my life ever was the day that I got to 
to baptize Alan and Rose Slocum. They're a little bit older than me. They come to faith in Jesus, but they followed through in believers' baptism. I, I still remember the thrill that was in my heart that day. I was hoping I'd be strong enough to, to pull Alan up. He is bigger than me. He's a strong man, <laughs> taller than me, but God gave us grace. And don't stone me, please. If you got stones, put them under your feet. Number seven, and you can argue with this, and that's okay. But I think God gave it to me. Jesus was an evangelical until the Holy Spirit came upon him. Verse Matthew 3.16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately with the, from the water, and behold... Another one. Wow, look at it. Behold, man, this is amazing. The heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And suddenly a voice come, came from heaven saying what a father says at his child's bar mitzvah. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. From now on, your name's on the checking account. Basically what, what that was all about. God the Father was so pleased with Jesus' obedience, even submitting to John for water baptism. And, and before his baptism, Jesus went about doing good, but you don't hear much about him. About all you hear, Luke 2, 42, that he grew in wisdom and, wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And when he was 12, he confounded the teachers at the, the uh, temple because of his wise questions and so on. But, but all the fables about little boy Jesus whittling birds and touching them and having, they're just fables. There's nothing. Jesus never did a miracle before he was baptized in the Holy Spirit. You can't do miracles without the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And number eight, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit after the Holy Spirit came upon him and led him into the desert where he was tempted by the devil for 40 days. The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove when he was baptized with water. And then Jesus was sorely tempted by the devil after his Holy Spirit baptism. So why do you think it's strange that when you get baptized in the Spirit and you start pressing in, that all hell breaks out. If the devil was after Jesus, don't you think he'll be after you? Faint not. Put on the full armor of God. Keep marching forward. Jesus pressed through that 40-day fast. And Luke 14, 414 says, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him went out through all the surrounding region. I'm waiting for that to happen here. Last week I told you, and I firmly believe that all it's going to take is one extraordinary miracle before people start flocking to this church. They won't get their ears tickled here. And toes might be stepped on sometimes. Don't tell anybody, but your pastors are human. He sometimes reacts rather than responds. They'll have to put up with that. But there, there will be that kind of stuff coming at. But let me ask you the question. If Jesus needed to be baptized in the Holy Spirit to complete his mission, doesn't it make sense we must be spirit baptized to complete our mission? Now I usually listen to somebody on YouTube while I'm taking my shower. It's about the only time of the day that I'm not busy doing something. And the day I was working on this message, I was listening. It might have been to, by Chuck Misler. Pam's been listening to him and saying, you need to listen to this one. But he was preaching on, on Hebrews 6, 1 to 3. Therefore, leaving, putting them behind you, the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And the Greek word means maturity. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God or the doctrines of baptisms. Notice the S there. Baptisms, plural. Baptism in water, baptism in the Holy Spirit. 
of laying on of hands and resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do, or let us do this if God permits. And, and he's, the writer says all of these things are the elementary, the foundational principles of Christ, repentance, laying on of hands, consecration, <laughs> baptism in the Spirit, resurrection of the dead, and all that. And, and then he brought up that, that, that baptisms. And the baptisms, plural, is one of the elementary, one of the rudimentary principles of Christ. Every believer is to be baptized in water when they put their faith in Jesus for, for salvation. But from the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus during the, his water baptism, the example is, is set that one baptism, just that of water, is not enough. If you want to be effective in ministry, if you want to uh, heal the sick and cast out demons and so on and so forth, you need that second baptism, that baptism in the Holy Spirit, that baptism in the power of the Spirit. And the book of Acts is so amazing when it demonstrates how ordinary believers became extraordinary after they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Peter, who cowered, Denied Jesus three times that he even knew Jesus. Stood up and preached an amazing message without notes. Why? Because he had been baptized with the Holy Spirit. The, the cowards became courageous after their baptism. And going back to Elizabeth, she was filled with the Holy Spirit at Mary's greeting when the baby le leaped within her womb. And she immediately began prophesying. Was Zechariah filled with the Holy Spirit when he prophesied? Yeah, but not until then. Now his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit. What happened? He immediately began prophesying. His first uh, prophetic word goes from Luke 1, 68 to 79. We're not going to read that. How about Mary, the, the mother of Jesus? Was she filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, let's read the scripture, Matthew 1, 18 and 20. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother, Mary, was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found by, with child of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, but while she thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream, saying, uh, to, this was to Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you, Mary, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Maybe this. Maybe I'm going to digress for a minute. But when Jesus said, "From the belly will flow rivers of living water," the Greek word for belly is womb. From your womb, from the productive part of your body, the reproductive part of your body, both men and women shall be filled with with the Holy Spirit, and those rivers will flow to you. So. Um, the angel messengers are showing him all these things. And, and then looking back to Zechariah, uh, the book of Zechariah, not, not the one that had John the Baptist. But there's 14 chapters in that book. But in Zechariah 4, 1 to 5, it says, Now the angel who talked with me came back and wakened me as a man waking out of sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? So I said, I am looking, and there's a lampstand of, pure, of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the seven stand, seven lamps with seven pipes of the seven la to the seven lamps. Two olive trees. This is pretty precise, don't you think? Two olive trees are by it, and one at the right of the bowl and the other is on the left. And I love this. I remember way back in 2000 when I started seeking the king of the kingdom and the kingdom of God rather than denominationalism. And I wrote a, king, a book, Kingdom Thoughts. I ended up with Kingdom Thoughts 1, 101 and Kingdom Thoughts 201. But I wrote that book not for the people, although I, I gave them copies of it, a page or seven pages a week of what God has given me. But I wrote that book for me so I might understand what the kingdom is. And one of the scriptures I used was this one. So God showed Zechariah this dream. Uh, this vision, and he said to the angel talking with him, what are these? 
I'll tell you, if you're filled with the Spirit, maybe even before you're filled with the Spirit, God is going to give you visions and dreams that you can't understand. And right here is a protocol. What do you do? You go right back to the Lord and say, what are these? Explain this to me. Then the angel talked with me and answered me. Do you not know what these are? Sometimes God says, duh. Jesus said, are you still so dull? <laughs> duh. Do you not know what these are? And Zechariah humbled himself and said, no, my Lord. It's okay to admit to God that you don't understand what God wants you to know. Are you seeing things that you don't understand? Do you need the Lord to help you to understand what's going on in your family, your church, your world? Then you need to do what Zechariah did when he was lost for understanding and direction in his topsy-turvy world. Consider what the angel spoke to him, reading from Zechariah 4, 6, and 7. So he answered me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but my, by my spirit. I tell you, if we get a hold of what that means, we'll go beyond where we've been before individually and corporately. Says the Lord of hosts, Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. God's prophesying that, that that mountain that you're facing can become a plain if you begin prophesying to it. And you shall bring forth a cap, capstone with shouts of grace, grace to it. In the Old Testament, grace is usually interpreted from amen. Amen, amen, let it be done, let it be done. And it's interesting. Remember last week we talked about grace for grace? Um, look at how it's used in John 1, 14, 1, 16, 1, 17 reviewing from last week. And the Word, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we built, beheld His glory, the glory, as He only begotten, full of, of the Father, full of grace and aletheia, truth, reality. I'll explain that more later. And of His fullness, verse 16, we have all received, received and grace for grace, or grace upon grace. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth, grace and reality came through Jesus Christ. The Greek word for, for truth really means reality more than it means the opposite of a lie. Yesterday I had a lady from somewhere uh, uh, come. In fact, we had ladies from three different places come and ministering together. Um, but I printed out some, I printed out a thing called ungodly belief systems. I, I knew she needed to break the ungodly beliefs that the devil had put over her life. But I also knew that she needed to come into the godly beliefs. I am more than conqueror through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am a saint saved by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, I am, he is able to do all things through me. All things work together for the good because I'm called according to the Lord. And because, verse 26 of Romans 8, because I'm praying in the Spirit, expecting these kinds of answers and, and, and so on and so forth. So this is something God wants to release, grace and reality, who we really are. The devil wants to make you think you're a loser. That you're too old, too young, too dumb. Too proud. Go back to the scripture. Take a hold of what God says about you. The reality is that God not only gave us his son for salvation, he gave us his spirit for empowerment to do the works that Jesus did and even greater works according to John 14, 12. We need both. In fact, I'll read John 14. It's in, in the notes for you. Most assuredly, Jesus speaking, he who believes in me, the works, who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Well, thank God for salvation. But what the world needs now is for every believer to be so filled with the Holy Spirit that they can carry the good news of Jesus Christ, 
His healing power, His prophetic words, His demon-busting power into the jails and into the stores and into the workplaces uh, that where people are, are more desperate for the work of God than they have been since the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. We cannot sit back and watch our families and neighborhood be destroyed by the wrath of God. We must receive the power of the Holy Spirit so we can be His witnesses and witness with His power in this world that has become increasingly dark. God help us. God, you saved us. Now baptize us in your Holy Spirit and help us turn this topsy-turvy world right side up. It was a heathen who said that the Christians were turning the world upside down. Jesus calls us to turn this world right side up. And only we can do it. Pastor Gaylord Van Aken is preaching a series on love. And he shared Wednesday at our Apostolic Strike Force meeting. He said, I, I see three components of love, compassion, intimacy, and commitment. And I shared something Pastor Vic Parado shared years ago. Every miracle in the Bible swings on the hinge of compassion. And Jesus, filled with compassion, started healing the sick and, and doing the miracles that he did. So we need the grace. We need to press in to the fullness of the baptism of the Holy Spirit individually and as a church. I referred to it earlier. I'm going to read it again. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, asotia, uh, full salvation, robbed of power, but be filled with the Spirit. And then Colossians. For this reason, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Is there anybody that does not want that? Verse 11, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us as partakers of the inheritance of the saints of light. He has delivered us from the powers of darkness. He has conveyed, get these words, he has conveyed to us, you and me, the kingdom of the Son of His love. I'll tell you what, kings and queens, we need to shake this world up in a good way. We need to bring this world into truth and reality. God will not do it without us. We cannot do it without His Holy Spirit baptism. Let's pray and then I'll have you stand for a blessing. Father, we cry out for more. More of the love and the, the family, the body life that we experienced during communion this morning. When we dared to take a step of faith and do it different than we've ever done it. Lord, I ask you to give us Holy Spirit conviction to press in until we're filled with the power to change the circumstances of our lives and our families. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand for a blessing. I really sense this is from the Lord, not from me. I bless you with a quickening of Holy Spirit. An activation of the gifts of the Spirit. I bless you with a readiness and a willingness to take that step of faith going beyond where you've ever been before. I, actually the Lord, not I, blesses you with these things in Jesus' name. Amen.